I'm Maggie Vespa. Welcome to a special edition of The Story. It is, of course, the end of the year, so we're taking a look back at some of the best, some of the worst, and some of the biggest moments from 2021 and, frankly, from this show. And as always, we want to hear from you, so send us your favorite memories from the past year. You can email the story at kgw.com or use that hashtag, the story KGW. And all that said, let's start things off on a positive note because you know we've been covering the housing crisis in the Portland metro area for years and a lot of times things don't look so good but this year we took a big step forward good evening i'm maggie vespa this is the story and this is progress i'm in portland's housing crisis let's pan around and show everybody this is rockwood village in gresham hundreds of units brand new all affordable housing and clearly based on the construction crews you can see they're still going up they want to finish these as fast as possible and get people moved in. So how did this happen and, and why now? Well, remember that affordable housing bond, that historically large affordable housing bond that you, the Metro voters, approved in 2018? Well, the money is in and clearly it's getting spent. Trying to get an apartment, it's getting harder and harder and harder. Amid a housing crisis, hope is hard to come by. No one knows that better than Aralise Daisy Mejia. Which floor are you on? It's the first one. A single mom of four boys, Mejia was born in Mexico, but has lived most of her life in Portland. Hello. <laughs> Say hi, hi to the camera. Last month, at the age of 38, she moved into her first really, really apartment. Oh my God, that was so amazing. I still didn't believe it until I got the keys in my hands. <laughs> it is huge. Now I can cook, you know, for my kids. Mejia found this brand new two bedroom in Gresham's Rockwood Village after searching for more than a year. Before that, she'd spent years staying at a friend's place and at times sleeping in her car while her kids stayed with their dad. Repercussions of a tough divorce. I didn't want my kids to be um, going through that with me because when I did it, you know, it was... Well, I just, it was myself. Last year, she decided she and her boys needed a stable home. Mejia works in customer service, but was blown away by the high cost of rent in Portland. And that wasn't the only barrier. You have to have, like, mom, first month, last month of rent deposit and, like, other things, you know. And I didn't have, like, a lot of things on, on my name. So it was kind of hard to, to prove that um, my credit was good. Mejia was struggling to find that hope until she found Rockwood Village, a brand new complex of affordable units willing to overlook a history of bad credit or waive first and last month's rent. Little did Mejia know this complex was the result of years of momentum. And it started in 2018. This is an interesting issue, the Metro housing bond. That November, local voters made history, approving measure 26199, a 20-year, nearly $653 million affordable housing bond. The promise? To boost affordable housing inventories in Clackamas, Washington, and Multnomah counties, adding more units with subsidized rents, and helping more people break the cycle of sleeping on local streets and in shelters. Many of those people wait for an affordable housing unit for one to two years on average. The area just doesn't have enough. Fast forward to now, the money is in and it's getting spent. And we will be seeing tangible examples of that. Yeah, it's so exciting. Metro Council President Lynn Peterson is cheering the progress more than anyone. She says Rockwood Village is a perfect example. This massive brand new complex near Southeast 185th and Yamhill has 224 units, all affordable housing. This one is a four bedroom, big enough for a family. Rockwood's construction was paid for in part by the Metro Affordable Housing Bond, five $5 million went to this project. Peterson says they're moving people in unit by unit as soon as they open up. The situation on our streets didn't happen overnight and it won't get solved overnight. The truth is housing ends homelessness. So we're focused on helping people permanently get out of homelessness. That help is getting spread out across the metro area. Congratulations, voters. We did it together. Catherine Harrington is the chair of Washington County. She heard we were looking into how the Metro Affordable Housing Bond money is being spent and asked to meet us here. Oh, they're beautiful. This 
is Viewfinder, another affordable housing complex in Tigard. You can see from our tour, it's still going up. But when it's done, it will offer 81 units of affordable housing. Metro poured $11 million of bond funding into this project. Harrington agrees it can't open fast enough. For three years, she knows voters have been wondering, where's that money going? Unfortunately, it takes a little while to get development plans approved and to get all the financing figured out and all the contract workers set up. But it's happening, folks, and we have a pipeline now. In fact, Viewfinder, which is scheduled to open this year, is one of seven affordable housing projects funded by the housing bond and currently under construction across the metro area. Others include Fuller Road Station, which will offer 100 units in Clackamas County, and River Place in Portland that will offer 177 units. Overall, the 20-year bond is expected to add 3,900 units of affordable housing to the metro region, with hundreds opening each year. All right, so that was the good. So now let's talk about, unfortunately, the bad, because even with that progress, our housing crisis is still a huge problem. And this year, we spent a lot of time focusing on its impacts on Old Town. So let's take a look back now with our old friend, Dan Haggerty. So tonight's big story is Old Town. Have you been down there lately? Do you know why they call it Old Town? I want to read a quick description from Travel Portland. This is the one that's online right now. The city's oldest neighborhood is filled with surprises from authentic Chinese restaurants, tea houses, and a city block sized traditional garden. Portland's original downtown is a bustling entertainment district and streetwear shopping hub. That's one way to put it. Yeah, it is full of surprises. I'll admit that. But I think you're missing a few details. For instance, Old Town currently is nothing like that at all and is actually a total disaster. Its streets are lined with tents and homelessness and suffering and addiction, mental illness and violence. The businesses are struggling not just to stay open, but to keep their workers safe. Same goes for some of the nonprofits that are down there. And some of the people who live in that area or commute through there are terrified or are becoming victims of some of this violence. Now, we've been wanting to do a story on Old Town for some time now because we know that it is less of a bustling entertainment district and more like a humanitarian crisis with lives on the line. And I'm not, under, I'm not overstating that. Over the summer, just a few examples here. Over the summer, an out-of-town visitor, a tourist, was chased by a woman and stabbed in the street. The attack was random, unprovoked, and it happened in the middle of the day. Or this story, in late August, when two women and a boy, a six-year-old, were attacked by a woman with a hatchet and an axe while they waited in line for pizza. Or all of the shootings that we've seen down in that area, like this one we reported on, when five people were shot at a vigil in Old Town, while those people were down at the vigil remembering their friend who was killed after being shot in Old Town. In the last year, there have been five homicides in Old Town. The year before, there were zero. There have been 20 shootings over the past year in Old Town, more than twice than the number that we saw there the year before. And the vast majority of those, 70% of them, were just in the last six months. And let me give you an example of just one of those shootings, like the vigil shooting that I mentioned just a moment ago, a drive-by that was caught on, her, on hotel surveillance camera. I mean, what kind of gun that is. Uh, and that counts, all those shots, that counts as one shooting in the books. That is the real Old Town. Or should I say Chinatown, right? That's the other name that it goes by because of its rich history of Chinese influence. Remember what Travel Portland said? The authentic Chinese restaurants, tea houses, and a city block-sized traditional garden. Well, that traditional garden is a treasure in this city, or at least it's supposed to be. This is footage from the KGW vault when Lan Su opened 21 years ago. Things have changed. The executive director of Lan Su sent out this letter to everyone involved with the garden explaining that the situation there is dire. I'll let her explain the details. This is Elizabeth Nye. I have had staff in the last week assaulted. I have had staff in their cars chased with uh, people chasing after them with metal pipes. We had somebody die on the streets right next to Lansu. We have had gunshots. 
um, all of this is too much to ignore and not address. We will do what is necessary for us to keep our staff, our visitors, and our volunteers safe. Do you feel forgotten about by the people in this city? That's a great question. I don't um, know that we are forgotten about. I feel like people see what is happening. I just am not convinced there's an urgency to addressing what is happening. How urgent is this? Now, it is extremely urgent. All right, still ahead, we continue our look back at 2021, which unfortunately included a major tragedy, the extreme heat wave. People have access to different levels of resource to, to weather a heat wave. And the folks who perished, who lost their lives, were those that had access to, to none or the fewest. And we also followed what felt like a never ending saga with the Newburgh School Board. A look back at how we got here when the story continues. Welcome back to a special edition of the story. We're taking a look back at 2021 and one of the biggest stories this year was, of course, the historic deadly heat wave back in June. More than 100 people across Oregon died and we spent a lot of time asking how did that happen and who, if anyone, should be held accountable. Once again, here's Dan Haggerty. 79 people are dead in Oregon because we could not save them from the heat. 79 people, and that number is expected to go up. It's expected to rise. Imagine for just a minute that it was a fire that killed 79 people, or an ice storm that froze 79 people to death, or a plane that went down at PDX with 79 souls on board. We'd have politicians surveying the damage. We'd have national news reporting live from downtown. But tonight, the latest tweet from Mayor Wheeler is about a billboard. Granted, it's a great billboard. It's about rising up against hate, but it's not what I expected at the top of his feed, considering these facts, considering that 79 people are now dead in the state. Average age, 66 years old. Most of these people dying alone in their homes and in their apartments with no air conditioning and no fan. Pat Doris talked to a local doctor who actually went door to door last weekend checking on vulnerable people. Does it surprise you to hear about all the deaths from the heat wave? It doesn't surprise me, but it's very saddening because I think it's preventable. It's not, um, it's not like the natural disaster happens and then you're cleaning up afterwards. It's like we know it's coming and there's things that we can do um, to help. So what could we have done? What should we have done differently? How will we handle this next time? And climate scientists assure us there will be a next time. And we ask those questions to all of our local elected leaders. The only city commissioner to go in front of a camera for us was rookie lawmaker Dan Ryan. I look forward to analyzing our city's response and seeing what, if anything, can be done differently in the future. I will say that as a lifelong Portlander, we've never been here before. We have responses for winter conditions in ways that we don't have for temperatures of 115, you know, it's an oven. And I know that all of us were doing the best we could. I know I personally went to the cooling stations, um, showed up and was responsive to what needed to be done to be helpful. And I think a lot of Portlanders were, were, were leaning into that, but I will tell you that it's grim, it's sad, and we need to be reflective and honest about what we can learn from what happened and how we will do much better in the future. We reached out to some people with Metro as well, and Councilor Christine Lewis and I had a conversation, and she said something that really stuck out to me. People have access to different levels of resource to, to weather a heat wave, and the folks who perished, who lost their lives, were those that had access to, to none or the fewest. Okay. Wow. Think about it. How devastating. When a tornado, for instance, spins through a neighborhood, it does so indiscriminately. I mean, that's how natural disasters typically work. That's why they're so scary, because no matter how prepared you are for, say, a, a wildfire, it can still take everything from anyone. But in this heat wave, if you had reliable air conditioning, it wasn't much more than boring because you were stuck inside. 
If you had transportation to one of the cooling centers, it was inconvenient. But for people who suffer from social inequality, this was their own personal wildfire, their own personal tsunami, their own devastating natural disaster, while most of us wrote it out on Netflix. All right, I think it's safe to say before this year, school boards, school boards had never been so interesting or frankly gotten so much attention, at least not in recent memory. And the epicenter of school board drama in Oregon was in the tiny town of Newburgh. Now, we could spend this entire half hour talking about everything that's happened in Newburgh, but instead, let's take a look at how we got here. The saga of the Newburgh School Board has several chapters, so let's recap. How did we get here? We'll start back in May 2019 when Brian Shannon was elected to the Newburgh School Board. He ran on a conservative platform as an outsider and promised to, quote, shake things up. Then this spring, two more conservative board members were elected. They were backed by a right wing political action committee called Community Oriented Public Servants. In August, Shannon introduced a ban on Black Lives Matter and pride flags and signs in district buildings. Despite national outcry, the board's conservative majority voted for that ban. But the superintendent questioned the legality of the ban and the ACLU threatened to sue. So in September, the board voted to expand the ban, covering any symbol considered political, quasi-political or controversial. Meantime, during this whole debate, Newburgh kept making headlines for racism in its schools. Snapchat messages surfaced showing a group of Newburgh High School students participating in a virtual slave trade, talking about auctioning off their black classmates. Then a Newburgh school staffer showed up to work in blackface, claiming she was dressed as Rosa Parks to protest the vaccine mandate for teachers. That staffer was reportedly fired. But back to the school board's ban on political symbols. Brian Shannon is facing a recall campaign because of it, and the Newburgh Teachers Union is suing the district over the ban. Now the school board's conservative majority has fired the superintendent after he said he would not enforce the ban. And that's how we got here. All right, still ahead, one of our favorite moments on the story this year when you, our viewers, helped us clean up downtown. A successful day, huh? Definitely a successful day. Happy to be able to do this. Yeah. Happy to be when the story continues. Here's the s oh, you died of dysentery. <laughs> oh, my goodness. No surprise that Oregon Trail opened. It was one of the favorite things that we did this year on the story. And one of our other favorites was launching our Hey Help campaign. It's a donation drive that we hold for a different nonprofit every single week. And we ask you to give whatever you can, no matter how small. And it all started when our team decided to do a cleanup with the group Solve along with you, our viewers. Our of the story viewers are incredible. We met so many of them today. Just we had more one. than 60 volunteers come out here, more than 60 bags of trash as well, which works out to be more than 600 pounds of trash, great. they tell us, which is incredible. And again, you know, we had our story viewers sign up because you talked about it on the show. Also, a ton of your donations came in. They thought they got hacked. So many <laughs> donations came in after we talked about it on the story. So we're not talking. I mean, let's just show you how incredible today was. We are doing this. Oh yeah. Have you guys done this before? No. Nope. Oh my gosh. Are Good you morning. Hello. Hello. Here's your bag. You know, Dan Haggerty really, he's got us the most volunteers that we've had in a long time. Well, we so knew the story viewers loved 
a challenge. Whenever Dan calls, I show up. So uh, We knew you cared about your city. Dan, you know, Dan the man, he's my guy. But seeing volunteer after volunteer line up on a chilly weekday morning to pick up trash blew us away. I saw this on the news and I was tired of people complaining about how dirty it was, so I wanted to come down here and join everyone in cleaning it up today. Our team joined in too, including the story's executive producer. We've gotten a huge response from the community. To make Wednesday's cleanup happen. There's definitely trash underneath these bridges as well that you want to keep an eye out for. We coordinated with Solve, a seasoned veteran of volunteer cleanups. We had been talking with Solve and I'd been seeing the amazing work they're doing and it just, it matched up, but it's, they did this, not us. It was obvious Portland's trash problem is hitting home for everyone. The only reason we did this is because of the people at home who, who wrote into us and said, I want to find a way to help. It's therapeutic to hear from people about these things. Yeah. Like we cover it and we're affected by it. For Dan, it was also therapeutic to learn we'd be using recycled malt bags to carry the trash. Well, now I can responsibly drink more beer and feel like I'm truly helping society. It is 8.30 in the morning. That was aggressive. <laughs> and on that sobering note, we were off. 61 volunteers on a mission to clean up their city. Dan and I hit the beach. I mean, I would say most of what I've picked up has been cigarette butts, piece of plastic. It's sad because we have all these geese wandering around and you see them stepping over these things. It's a little heartbreaking. Our producers went inland, as did a lot of people. So it's a bunch of like a million little plastic pieces. I think about like little kids running through here in the summer and stuff, and I would hate for them to step on it. In the crowd, Oregon's state treasurer, Tobias Reed. Yeah. You feel like you see the trash that everybody else sees. Yeah. And it, I mean, how does it yeah. how does it hit you when you see it? Well, it just feels like we're, we're missing opportunities, and it's not the same uh, community that, that uh, is so special. And he brought his eight-year-old son, Ellis. And a chance to, um, to be hands-on uh, is, is uh, it gives us more optimism and, and hope, I think. This was one of four cleanups organized by Solve on Wednesday. The story volunteers were tireless. They worked for three hours. Good job! Eventually, people trickled in and bags piled up. People will go out and they'll say there's not that much trash, but then at the end of the cleanup, you've got this huge pile and it really shows that there still is a lot of litter to be picked up. The grand total for the stories solve cleanup? More than 600 pounds of trash now gone from downtown. A successful day, huh? Definitely a successful day. Our team was ecstatic. We did it. Our viewers are the real MVP. Happy to be able to do this. Yeah. Happy to be it's clear Portlanders want to clean up their city. And the story was happy to pitch in. Our viewers are the best. That's it for this special edition of the story. Thank you to everyone who watched this year. Keep sending in your favorite memories from 2021 to the story at KGW.com or use the hashtag the story KGW on Twitter. We'll see you in 2022.